So in terms of the, you mentioned the different uh, these time histories. For instance, you have Greek, Egyptian, Syrian, a lot of different areas. So from the 10, you mentioned around 10 time ten departments. 10 departments. So where would be the, the ones that you want to highlight? So any department in particular you want to highlight or one area that you think is your biggest uh, assets? Oh, they all are very important to my career. I mean, my Chinese collection, for example, is the largest and best outside of China in private hands. I, my African art collection, I mean, my Chinese collection amounts to over 2,000 museum quality pieces. I have my African art collection which I blame to Pablo Picasso, who I met when I was 16 years old, in my father's shop. And he and another gentleman were speaking about African art. And I was infuriated, you know, because I wanted to sell my Greek or Roman or biblical things to these clients. And I turned around to Pablo Picasso. I mean, I did not know then who he was and said, please, you know, I want to introduce you to Greek and Roman art. You know, African art is ugly and primitive. So he turned around, you know, and uh, patted my shoulder and in a very cruel tone of voice said to me, young man, never underestimate art, you understand nothing about. Amongst African artists, you sometimes find talents that are far superior than the Greeks and the Romans. I mean, at that time, I disagreed, you know, with them. But after collecting a lot of the works that I have, which amounts over 5,000 items presently, I can see what he meant. And he mentioned that even though an African artist did, does, did not go to school, the way the Greeks and the Romans, but there are talents that could produce outstanding works for their traditional and religious and cultural symbolism and significance. So there you go, you know, I have a very important collection of African art. I do have Greek art, I have Roman art, biblical pieces, Sumerian pieces, and uh, Asian items, you know, from Cambodia, you know, from Thailand, you know, from, uh, you know, we covered China, you know. I expanded my interest into Hinduism, Hindu art, you know, I cover almost all the major Hindu deities, you know. So your, um, coming back to your history and some of your uh, public information, so your early collections were in classical, biblical, Egyptian, and later Meso Mesoamerican and pre-Columbian art. And uh, partly there's a story that uh, this later Mesoamer Mesoamerican pre-Columbian art was that you had a team that, uh, in part of your life story, that was influenced by the actor um, John Huston, and of course one of the biggest personalities in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was the one that became a friend and influencer for you to go in these directions, but as well to open your gallery in LA. Do you want to talk about this? Because it's not This a... is very interesting, you know. As I told you, at the age of 13, uh, you know, I met uh, Bella Chagall, who was the granddaughter of Mark Chagall. And, you know, as teenagers, you know, we hung around and we went even to the studio of Mark Chagall and used some of his canvases and painted both of us on the canvases. He was always excited to see how interested both of us are in, in the art. And when I started painting, I hung one of my paintings in my father's shop at the time to show off and to be proud that this is what I have accomplished. A gentleman comes in who had became, you know, friend of the family at a later time. He saw one of my paintings and he said, is this a Jackson Pollock's painting? I turned around and I, the truth of the matter is, I, it's the first time I hear Jackson Pollock. I did not know who Jackson Pollock was. 
so differently, you know, I said, sir, this is not Jackson Pollock, this is my painting. I painted it. And he looked down at me, he was a tall gentleman. And he said, bullshit, this is a Jackson Pollock. And again, I said, sir, I painted this. He said, how much is it? I said, it's not for sale. I just took this painting, you know, to share, you know, with the friends and the family, and I hope you like it. He said, yes, I like it, but you have to tell me the price. And he was offended that I said it was not for sale. He said, if it's not for sale, take it down the wall. I turned around and said, $10,000, sir. And to my big surprise, he pulled out his checkbook and wrote $10,000 for me, you know, for the first painting I ever saw. <laughs> <laughs> and he grabbed the painting and I got $10,000, you know, from him. But he was very happy, you know, with it but became a friend of ours. It turned out to be Mr. John Houston, who was the film producer. And he was the one that started the, my interest in Mesoamerican art. We have a lot of these biblical fertility goddesses that we call Astarte, for example, and some of the Greek and the Roman <laughs> different deities that I used to sell. He says, you know, I go to Mexico and there are many similar things, but they are less expensive than the things that you are selling here. And he, on other trips of his, you know, he started bringing some of these things and I started exchanging Mesoamerican art to biblical and to classical pieces with him. And the fact that he was at one time living in Los Angeles he invited me over to his home and I saw an incredible collection that he had. And it got me quite interested in thinking of moving to the United States and learn more about Mesoamerican art. And I also have possibly the world's biggest Mesoamerican art collection in the world. Wow, well, that's very impressive. impressive. He was the person that sparked my interest. If you go online, you will see over 100 different publications on the different subjects that I have covered through my life. Oh, that's really impressive. I want to touch one thing. So, for instance, when you start that part of your collection, you visit the places, you hire archaeologists. Yes, you know, I went and, of course, I went and visited Mexico. I went to Guatemala. I went to San Salvador. I visited Costa Rica. Uh, I mean, any of these subjects that were of fascination to me, I visited the archaeological sites, I became good friends with the archaeologists at the museums and the curators at the museum, and built that contact so I could learn the maximum possible about all these things. Yeah, that's really impressive. So you always kept the, your scientific side on this study and the way you put the methodologies. So I, I have to ask you one question on this is, so as one of the, the world's most prominent art collectors and the story that touches, um, I would say, all the 20th century, or at least the second half of the 20th century, and, and that you have both the contact with the artists that were creating modern art and these three art, and then even picking a lot of collections that at the time there were not so much uh, documentation as, as, as we have now, and partly you yeah. were responsible for that. How, did you, how do you look for all these achievements in your career but as well would be kind of some parts of your life that you want to highlight. There were very important moments. Moments you mentioned Picasso, uh, you mentioned John Huston, and uh, and of course uh, um, Chagall, which I think was quite important for you as well as a painter. But give us a bit some highlights of these personalities that you mentioned in history of art. I mean, I being in the art field and being a dealer in the art. You know, we handle the work of art, we analyze it, we study it, we research it, we discuss it, you know, with people who are experts, you see, in, the, in their own field on a regular basis. So that has been a, a passion of mine to develop my understanding and my education constantly because of the different varieties of the different subjects that I handle. There is no dealer in the world that I know of that have amassed as much 
material as I did through the years, and the quality of the items that I have are quite superior. Oh, that's, uh, so you're sitting next to, for example, an iron bull there that has a price of 25 million pounds from the Tang Dynasty. Well, you have objects that I have here that any museum, any major museum in the world would die to have. So you have one of the biggest collections of uh, uh, Islamic and Arabic art um, that exists in the world today. Yes. Can you tell us about that collection? How did you build it and a bit of the present state? My Islamic collection is possibly one of the best known in the world. Uh, a lot of it, you know, was acquired already, you know, by the museum in Qatar. And uh, I still have several thousand items consisting of things from the beginning of Islam, from the time of the Prophet Muhammad, through the time of the Mamluks. And uh, I'm very proud of it. One of the most exciting things that I have acquired not long ago, that I'm very excited to share with you, is one of the world's largest Qur'ans in the world from the time of the Mughals, from the 16th century. And I'd be very happy, you know, to show it to you. Wow, that's impressive. Can I, just one question. So to build this collection, um, how did you do the research and where you kept it and how do you build this until we have it now? Different people from different countries have always approached me, you know, to sell me these items. So I'm very well known all the world, through all the world on a daily basis. I have middlemen or dealers that come across important works of art. They send me pictures of them and I buy them either online, they send them to me by post, or many of them come travel if they're very precious, you see, to sell them to me, directly to me. Fantastic. Yeah. And from this Islamic uh, art collection that you've been uh, collecting, and which is quite considerable in, in assets, you intend to build a, a specific event or a specific exhibition with this material? Definitely. You know, we hold exhibitions in each of the different galleries on different subjects. We have presently, and it's accessible, Three months ago, I held an Islamic art show in the gallery in Seoul, where we featured a lot of things relating to the Kaaba, you know, and the gifts that were offered by the Turkish sultans through the different time periods, uh, like the sitara, for example, or the belt that surrounded this, or the mahmal that carried the sitara, you know, from Egypt to Mecca you know, offered by Sultan Abdul Hamid. Uh, we have many very interesting things and all these are accessible on our website that one can see and study about. So my last question is... Um, and next to you there, there is a bag that carried the key of the Kaaba uh, presented by one of the Sultans 500 years ago. You can look at it and... I don't know. Yeah, that's impressive. Yeah, that's true. So this piece is 500 years ago. Yes, it is dated. It reads here, Mulana al Sultan al Ghazi, and it bears the date 850 uh, of the Hijra year, which places it to be over 500 years ago. This is in excellent condition. Yeah. yeah. So the Sultan had the key and the lock of the Kaaba carried in this beautiful silk bag. Wow. Yeah, well, people very listen, this is very special. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's been an honor. and <laughs> This is really impressive. For how much would be a piece like this? This is 60,000 pounds. Well, 500 years. 